This is a tutorial to show you how to get started building plugins using WDL OL, my version of iPlug. So first of all, we need to check out the repository from GitHub. Alternatively, you can just download a zip file directly from the GitHub page. I've also downloaded some SDKs. VST 2.4 and VST 3.51. These come from the Steinberg website. And first of all, I need to put some files from these SDKs in the respective folders in this working copy. So first of all, we need to put a couple of files from VST 2 in here. And you actually need those files to build any kind of plugin. Um, so let's go and get them. If you look at the readme.txt um, in each folder, it will explain exactly which files you need. So it's these two. Copy them in there. So now let's do the VST3 ones. In fact, I'm just going to copy the entire VST3 folder in there. So if I wanted to build um, RTAS plugins, I could extract this zip file and put the contents in here, but uh, I can't do that on video because it's under NDA. Anyway, those ones are all the files you need to extract on Mac. The audio unit headers are um, they built, built into the operating system. They come with uh, Xcode. So that's uh, pretty much set up now. Just one thing to note, if you're using Xcode 4, you need to open this XC config file and you need to change the compiler. Um, so if you've got line and Xcode 4, you probably want to uncomment this line and comment out this line. And also you probably won't have the 10.5 SDK, so you need to change the base SDK to 10.6 and it won't currently work with the 10.7 SDK. Another thing to do is to make sure that you have write permissions to the system plugin folder. I build all my plugins to the system folders um, and my installer scripts look for plugins and apps in those folders. Uh, by default you won't have write permissions so you either have to give yourself write permissions to those folders or you can change, you can uncomment these lines, sorry, comment out these lines and uncomment these ones to build to the user plugin folders. But if you do that, um, bear in mind some of the installer scripts might not work. Right, so now we've set up most things. If we go in iPlug examples, you'll see there's, um, there's quite a few different e example projects. These also kind of serve as template projects. Um, I have a duplication script here which allows you to copy a folder and inside that folder you've got the Xcode project, the Visual Studio project, various scripts, some scripts for making installers and so on. And this duplication script will copy the folder and do a find and replace on all the file names and actually inside all the files as well. Um, so it will change the name iPlug effect, for instance, to whatever the new name of your new plugin would be. And then when you load up that new Xcode project, everything's ready to build all the different targets straight away and it saves a massive amount of time. I'll show you that in a second. First of all though, um, if we're using Xcode 3, I've actually set up some debugging executables, so basically it makes it, makes it easier to automatically debug a plugin in a particular host just by choosing that host in Xcode. But 
that works based on uh, your your OSX username. So if you want to get access to that, you need to double click this shell script and that will do a find and replace and change some some of the Xcode projects um, so that they have a reference to your OSX username and that way all the, the debugging executables will, will show up. Anyway, let's uh, duplicate iPlug effect. So this script, it's a Python script and it has to be run from the command line. So if I cd into wdl ol cd I plug examples. Now I can run the script like this. And I type the name of the starting project and the new name for my new plugin. And my manufacturer name. Okay. Now, if I look in this folder, I've got a new folder called My New Plugin, and everything's been renamed. I can just open this one and all of these header files, everything, every time there was an occurrence of this. This, which used to be iPlug effect, it's now my new plugin, and I should be able to build this straight away. So, we've got various different targets to build to different plugin formats. There's also this one, which is an OSX standalone app, and you can see some of them say 32 Intel, that means 32 bit Intel only. These are fat binaries with 32 and 64 bit code. I don't have any PPC code, but you can add that if you want. Anyway, I'll build the standalone app version first. So here's what I was talking about. This is the debugging setup with uh, different executables. So if I go on app, that's going to, when I click build and debug, it will run the, the standalone app. So here we go. Okay, so here's the basic interface. It's got one parameter, the gain control. And that's the standalone app version. So that was pretty simple. Now let's build the VST2 and I'll just build the 32-bit Intel version. And I'm gonna choose, let's, uh, let's do it in live. And build and debug. So I've now got a VST2 plugin here called Miney Plugin. It, you can see it's the same interface, one parameter. Now change the target to target to audio unit, and I didn't change these before, but uh, it's a bit more important for audio units. You, there's two things that you need to customize: the unique ID for your plugin. So I'm just going to call this uh, INP, and you need to change your manufacturer ID. So this is because the uh, audio units catalog. Um, all the binaries based on those IDs. So, if we now build this, we can build and run. So, I now should have an audio unit called my plugin. You see, it's just the same. Finally, let's just try the VST3. OK, 
Okay, my new plugin. There we go, VST3 version. So the actual implementation for this plugin is really, really simple. And the nice thing about iPlug is there's far less code than the other options. So this here is a an overrided control. It's an, a knob with some text at the bottom. And this is the interface for the plugin class. You can see there's only actually a few methods in the class which we need to implement. Here's the constructor. We initialize parameters here. This is creating a GUI and attaching the knob. Loading in the bitmap from the resource. Here's where you create your presets. You can actually specify individual um, parameter values here as well, but this is just making a default preset. Here's the process replacing. Reset gets called when the sample rate changes or something like that. And on parameter change is where parameters, when parameters change, this function fires. So I'll do another video showing you how to set it up in Windows.